Welcome to the program. Today we talk about Waves in Motion, a singles retreat. We talk about daffodils and the coming of spring. We find out about the approaching event Moving Planet, a day beyond fossil fuels. And big plans for the Christchurch art scene. We talk with Warren Feeney about that. But first on the program, one of the most knowledgeable and respected teachers of Tibetan Buddhism in our part of the world. Kenpo, you are in Christchurch over the weekend. Tell me about the workshop and the chats that you've been having. Yes, uh, this is my first time in Christchurch. Uh, I always uh, like to come in this part of the world uh, because it's very similar to my hometown Tibet. It's not like a mountain, beautiful lake. So I came this weekend in this Christchurch. I run uh, three courses. Uh, Friday night I gave a public talk, uh, coping with the change. And then the weekend I run a meditation course. How did they go and what was the reason for it? Uh, I think uh, my belief, because I'm Buddhist, uh, we believe it's like a healthy mind is very important in this world because we need more than ever. So my philosophy is kind of a very much emphasized on the mind. So if I explain a little bit about the Buddhist perspective of the mind, maybe some contribution to bring a bit more peace in this world. What was the, why was it so important for you to come to Christchurch? Uh, I just, uh, it's called a little bit story. Uh, 10 years ago, I saw the South Island magazine. So when I saw the snow cup mountain and lakes, immediately I can stole my heart. So since then, I always want to come in South Island, look around. And then I came here uh, last year, Queenstown and Dunedin, uh, just about two and for talk. Then since then, I really feel connection to in the South Island. So I decided to maybe come and share my philosophy, my experience to people who live here, maybe some contribution. Tell me about what you shared with Christchurch over the weekend. Uh, mainly, I think, uh, firstly, I like, uh, really feel sad to what happened in Christchurch since uh, uh, September last year. Still, it's a little bit a fact. Lots of people are really uh, hard to cope. So I thought maybe Buddhist way point about how to cope with the change. Mm. So I just talk about Buddhist perspective because uh, I, we believe in, like, uh, there's nothing permanent. Everything is impermanent, subject to change. So we need to have a bro broader way to thinking. So that will help you us a little bit to cope with every day to day to live. Mm. Coping seems to be the poignant theme in Christchurch at the moment. How are you sort of saying to people how they should or can cope at the moment? Uh, I'd say like uh, we cannot uh, fight or, uh, with the nature. Nature is so powerful. Rather we should accept. Uh, it's a sad thing to what's happening in the Christchurch, but then you're not accepting and fighting for uh, this kind of uh, disaster, it makes it worse. Mm. So rather than fighting, it's just accepted, like move forward, move forward to your life. Okay. And uh, bring more positive in your mind, what you can do the rest of your life, rather than what happened in the past. So that's what you say, don't dwell on the past, just sort of co and that, cope with it and move on, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. So I have uh, two reasons to share. One is a Buddhist uh, kind of perspective, because we believe everything's impermanent, nothing there forever. Mm. So it subject you to change. And second reason, because I'm Tibetan, I had uh, experience uh, like my own home, home country invaded by communist uh, Chinese. So we lost country, we have uh, so many difficulties in our life, but we, we never look back and uh, what happened in the past, rather we move forward, what we can do better in our life and how I can help others. You also chat about having a healthy mind. Yes. How do we achieve this? Uh, it's possible because the mind that we have is like a uh, kind of a, no, fixed is changeable. So it's just changing mind, not going to be a better mind, but it's important to see the value of the mind. I, we believe it's like a, uh, every one of us want to be happy. We have a strong desire to be happy, mm. and every one of us has a desire not to be unhappy. So Buddhist uh, principle belief or philosophically saying like a prime cause of happiness is a healthy mind. So a healthy mind is not just come by itself. We have to be mindfulness day to day, and we have to kind of constantly maintain this positive mind. Positive mind means like a, like a not only just think about self, because a lot of uh, self-centered mind, selfish mind, cause lots of troubles. Mm. So instead of just so much caught up self, more look at others who have a problem, say what I can do for them, how I can make them feel more comfortable, how to, I can make them some contribution. So more you bring this kind towards other, that brings you a healthy mind. So it's kind of possible if you put it into practice.
What's the flow on effect if we do, you know, believe, believe the healthy mind is a you know, healthy world? What's the flow on effect there? Uh, I think I believe that like a healthy mind uh, uh, is really important for individual point of view and social point of view, economic point of view and environmental point of view. Because when we live in this world, three things are very important, social, environment and economic. So these things we can keep healthy if we have a healthy mind, because the root of everything is mind. Because at the moment, if you look at our world, economic is a big disaster, and the environment also so much uh, facing trouble. All this comes from human greedy mind. Mm. So if you keep kind of uh, feeding this greedy mind more and more, we're going to more destroy the social life, environment, economic. So that's not good for in the future generations. So protect this environment is up to us. So therefore, I believe like uh, to be more satisfaction, be more appreciated, be more grateful for what you got, rather than go after the greedy mind. Mm, okay. Now it's coming up to a year from our very first earthquake, September 4. Yeah. What would you say to people who, you know, on September the 4th, that's going to bring back a lot of memories from not only September's earthquake, but February's earthquake as well. Yeah. What would you say to them to sort of get through this? Yeah, it's a kind of uh, because we have this uh, fear what happened in the past, going to happen again. That's uh, very common. But this is unpredictable. Nature cannot predict. It may happen, it may not happen. But most important to live day to day in a positive way rather than worry something. Because worry can be uh, uh, cause so much uh, unhealthy in your mind and your health. Mm. So, so I say like uh, what happened has happened, but still you worry about that. It makes yourself as a very unhealthy life. Mm. So it's uh, not wise. So therefore I think like uh, just uh, more bring the positive what you can do in the future. Mm, okay. Are you coming back to the South Island sometime soon? Uh, I like so much this part of the world because I mentioned it's a very similar to my home country, like a Snorka Mountain. I kind of, in my heart, kind of desire or plan uh, comes once here in this part of the world. I look around a little bit and share my own Buddhist philosophy. Mm. So you'll be coming back soon? Uh, I'm planning to come next year in, around this time in uh, late August or beginning of September. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're most welcome here in Christchurch at the moment and in the South Island. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the program. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I hope I have more time to share my philosophy with your people in Christchurch and South Island. Now, for all you singles out there, Suzanne might just have the ticket for you to meet that very someone special. Suzanne, tell me about over the weekend you had the waves in motion. Yes, we did. Tell me about it. It was in Kaikoura. It was. It yeah. was a. Um, it was like a singles retreat, where we took a group of people from Christchurch to Kaikoura to meet Kaikoura singles, and we brought down some singles from Blenheim, and they took the train journey each, and joint together in Kaikoura. Fun. It was fabulous. For singles, fun. Yes. Now, any any gossip from the weekend? Anyone I get together? I have been sworn to secrecy. What, uh -huh. what goes on tour stays on tour. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> uh, so you, so there the, were some connections. Okay. Yeah. So well, there were some good. gorgeous connections, actually. And yeah. because uh, the base group from Christchurch, uh, they're actually members of our club, we had that... that that structure mm -hmm. and it just went from there and it was very friendly it was just lovely yeah. this is something that you do this is this is part of your job you're known as um, the cupid without the arrows is uh, that uh, right <laughs> well not exactly well I've had a heart for the unattached for a long time like 12 years and I figured that somebody's got to do it yeah <laughs> and I think that even like with this last year I've realised why I do it, because it's just so hard to meet people. Now we don't have the venues available that people can guarantee they'll be, they'll be able to go and meet single people. So what we've done is um, we've upped the ante really mm. and we're providing with a vehicle mm. and we don't have any control over anything really but we can provide the opportunity for people to meet like-minded people okay. in a nice environment. So the singles uh, retreat was par part of that and they went to Kaikoura and went, took part in activities during the day and the hospitality of Kaikoura was amazing. Like we went while watching and uh, fishing and 
um, Jerry and Nick from the Sophie Rose guaranteed the crayfish and they delivered mm -hmm. at the end of the trip. And then to Donegal House we had a themed event um, on the Saturday night and it was a midwinter Irish Christmas with uh -huh. Murray Boyd at, um, at that venue. Excellent. Yes. Now how, how often do you do these events? Because I know you have a club once a month. Yes. So how often are you going to be doing these oh, events? We have, we have events on a weekly basis. Oh really? And um, and they're, they're, we might have cocktail parties. There's actually two, two, uh, three prongs to the to what we do. Mm -hmm. We have the expose, which is thirty to forty five. Bonjour is forty five plus. But um, between forty and forty five, they uh, the people who can go to both, and it's just age generated, and so that people are meeting and they've got a little bit of flexibility. And it's cocktail parties or dine outs, or we sometimes do temp and bowling and sometimes do waves of motion yeah. and um, then we have a, a new one that we've launched just in the last 12 months called Club Evolution where we put everybody through a personality DNA mm. because I mean I can't be cute but I can't get it right <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I need some other other fallback mm. um, systems to work by so we do a personality DNA test and we have a questionnaire we meet the people and they dynamic at our events and then we pluck out of our membership the people we feel should meet. So there's a, there is a little bit, of, little bit of manipulation that goes on. Interesting. But based on some good foundation. Yeah, so yeah. do you have people coming to you saying, look, I've been single for too long, I need you to introduce me to somebody. And yes. is that what you do? Yes. You do? Yes. What's your success rate like? Uh, it's been very good. Really? Yes, it's been very good. Um, we've had a lot, we base it on friendship because I think if it's, if it's warm and friendly, um, then anything's got a chance of growing. Um, but uh, we've had a lot of marriages, a lot of people getting together, and some people come back after it's possibly not worked out, which is, yeah. which is great because we, we love to see them come back. They don't want to come back, but mm. we love yeah, to yeah. Them come back. But no, it's, um, yeah, it's, the success rate's very, very good. But you know, when you look at the last 12 months, um, being unattached is not favourable. It's mm. not, I mean, it's okay. Mm. I mean, people often don't need people, but when you look at the last 12 months where some people could have done with that someone to help them make decisions of mm. where do I go now? Someone to give them that hug to say, it's okay. You know, when you're a little bit scared of what might be or what's mm. happening, someone to be there. So that friendship's really important. Mm. So that's what we're really pushing as a starting point. So now it's like a really a good time, you know, than any to get together and to come to your club, your once a week club. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes I people. mean, they can come to whatever events they want mm. uh, through the course of the month. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a good mix of males and females? You know, I've just been um, I've just been smiling since the weekend because we can't get the weather right. It's, we don't have control over that, and we can't get the gender balance often right because it depends on who books in mm. and we got it all but one. Oh really? Yes and at the events yes it's occasionally it will fall one way or the other but we've been very lucky because we set a fairly good standard with our dress code etc mm. so I think where the men it's sometimes hard to get the men the men do come because they kind of like the style. Yeah. yeah okay and you know the age ranges as you say there's there are two different groups. Yes there are. So 30 to 45 30 is it? to 45 yeah. is the expose and yeah. 45 plus is bonjour but then between the 40 and 45 they can go to both but that's for the dine outs we break them up otherwise the cocktail parties are mixed. When's mm. the next event this coming? We're, we're just doing the calendar now okay. to come out this week for September. Okay. And but we do have a mingle with music at the end of the month. It's always the last Saturday of the month at Elevate. Okay. Uh, and where can we find out more information, Suzanne? You can find it on the website, which okay. is www.eventcreation.co.nz. Okay, eventcreation.co.nz. Yes. You are Christchurch's Cupid, aren't you really? <laughs> well, I don't kind of see it that way. <laughs> I do, I am doing my level best Good. to make things happen. Well, okay, excellent, Suzanne. Thanks for coming on the program today. After the break, we chat with Rachel Vogan about gardening. You're back with City Life, and this is always one of my favourite segments, Gardening with Rachel Vogan. Good to have you here. Oh, Kenita, you're great. The smell of these beautiful daffodils picked right out of your garden, They right? are, they are. Yes. And it's daffodil time. Have you got daffodils in your garden? Um, no. 
and I do have a garden now, so I have moved, so Crikey. perhaps I should plant some daffodils. Well, it's not the right time of year to plant right. them, but it is the right time of year to pick them. Okay. And there's a phenomenal display in Hagley Park at the moment of daffodils, mm. and, and gardens all around the city. Some of people are quite convinced that with the liquefaction that's come up from underneath the ground, that the daffodils are actually better. Really? But in some, yeah, they are. A lot of people think the micro-minerals that have come to the top with the liquefaction have actually really helped their daffodils bloom this year. Others have actually got the problem where the liquefaction's actually probably uh, limited the amount of success they've had with their daffodils, but mine are blooming beautifully, as you can see. I can see this. And it looks as though there are a couple of different sorts of daffodils. So these are the trumpet daffodils, these ones here, and they um, obviously sig uh, uh, most signified locally with the Daffodil Day, mm -hmm. which we've just had. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, so these aren't fragrant, but they're beautiful and they just flower and flower and flower. Mm -hmm. Then we've got these wonderful little fragrant jobs in here, the Sol Dior's, oh. and they are my favourites. And they start flowering back in May. So, really? And they are so fragrant. Not that one, this one. No, I know, but I didn't know that these weren't fragrant. Oh, no, well, some are, but these yeah. ones aren't. If, you, if you're wanting to go for perfume, and mm. perfume's such a wonderful thing, mm. you can just pick a little posy in the house and it can just, you know, permeate the room. Sol Dior's are really the best ones to plant for. What are these called again, sorry? Sol Dior's. Sol Dior's. Yeah, they're beautiful and they'll flower any time from sort of May, might have been flowering since May, they're still going, they'll go about another month. Mm. Whereas these are only just starting to come into bloom now and they'll continue going through to about label weekend. Now there are the um, other ones like this and they're sort of more creamier in colour. Yes, yes, that's called early cheer and that's beautiful. Mm. So some people like those just pale soft colours. Whereas I like the vibrant orange and yellow, mm. and there's a hundred thousands of different varieties that you can grow. Really? And there's some local places, um, Del uh, Bell Daffodils out in Leiston, mm. and they are commercial growers, and they have thousands upon thousands of varieties that you can go and pick a bucket full, have a nice day out in the country, just look in the, the your local paper and they advertise. And marvellous, you'll see just a myriad of varieties. Actually, just um, hearing you speak of people picking daffodils, mm -hmm. uh, Jared on camera one, he used to pick daffodils as well. He was telling me a story earlier about um, how he knew a child that was sick, so they picked 800 daffodils and took them wow. over to their house. So that Amazing. was lovely. <laughs> um, well, it's been much easier to pick daffodils than actually plant them and harvest them because you plant daffodil bulbs in the autumn because autumn is bulb planting time. Okay, so, so you, Yeah, so you can't plant daffodils now, so you plant them in the autumn. Okay. So spring's all about picking. And it's, daffodils are a wonderful gift. I actually prefer to leave mine in the garden so I can enjoy them as I drive up the drive and look out side to appreciate them. Mm. But I do really enjoy picking these small fragrant ones to have a nice sort of you know, fragrance through the house. Yeah. Now how long, I mean, what about the snow? Because we've had some snow. Yes. Do they still It's amazing. They still in? pop up through the snow. Like amazing. These were covered in snow for like 10 days and they still pop up and it's amazing when you see the snow starting to melt and there's the daffodil heads coming up and coming through. They're real hardy campaigners, daffodils. Yeah. They're phenomenal. And they'll last in a vase for weeks. And the most interesting fact I found out this year was that once they have this tremendous sap that actually mm -hmm. runs out the bottom of the stems. Mm -hmm. This sap, um, it can cause a few sort of skin irritations, but it actually means, um, allows the daffodil to actually be, once it's picked, to be left out of water for up to a week. They will survive picked out of water for up to a week. Oh my gosh. And I've tested that, and it's true. So it's amazing really, but to, oh. to keep them looking at their premium, you mm. should put them straight into water. Yeah, okay. And change the water frequently, every day or two, so it doesn't get too slimy and green looking, mm. and they'll last you a good sort of 10 to, uh, 10 to 14 days. Really, mm. 10 to 14 days? Yeah, and a good, nice bunch of daffodils at the moment, it's only three or four dollars. A bargain. Yeah. So what else can we look forward to at the moment with, in terms of Flowers, oh, spring flowers. Well, spring flowers are all just starting. Really. The rhododendrons are coming out into bloom. The camellias are in full cry. Mm. Tulips won't be far away. Mm. I just love tulips. And then we'll have all the hyacinths and all the other sort of spring bulbs. And then we'll be heading into rose season, which will, will probably co coincide with cup week. Oh, cool. And then it's into Christmas lilies, my quintessential favourite flower, Christmas. Me too. Oh. <laughs> now, when can I plant them? Is it, am I too late? You're bordering on being too late. Okay. Bordering on being too late. I've got a garden. I've got to plant. Oh, really? Well, I've got a small garden, yeah. Okay, so Maybe well, I should do generally you do those in the winter. That They um, are in the stores now, and you, the bulb's about the size of your fist. 
So if you get into the garden centre soon mm -hmm. and you can plant them in a pot or in the garden, mm -hmm. you will have something blooming for Christmas. Oh. Yeah, oh, they, are, they are my favourite too. You know the downside to them though? Um, is the pollen. I was, yeah, well, I don't have a problem with that, but other people do. No, the pollen, like it stains. So whenever I go to I snip know. it, I get it all On over my nose. benches and things like and that. And all over my clothes. I've, all, I've got Christmas lily pollen stains on everything. <laughs> But it's such a lovely smell though. Oh. Do you know that's something that's been pressing on my mind during this whole interview is just thinking, we had the Horticultural Society on the programme oh, a few yes. weeks ago mm -hmm. and they the number one flower in Canterbury, Christchurch, yes. is the rose. Yes. Second is daffodil. So yeah. Well, where they're situated in the middle of Hagley Park, they're surrounded by them and the, mm. the, the daffodils in the park this year are looking fabulous. So maybe if you're getting out and about for a walk, try Hagley Park. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. A little bit of fitness there for you as well. So, hey. Bring Rachel, it thank you for coming on the program. Good to see you. We'll be back after this break. You're back with City Life and I'd like to welcome Sasha and Nol Nolani from 350. Tell me about 350. Okay, well, basically, um, 350, if you haven't heard of it, um, I'll just explain it quickly. So 350 is um, the proven number to be a safe level of um, carbon parts per million, 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. Um, at the moment, <coughs> we are currently at 392, 393 parts per million. And when the movement first started in uh, 2009, there was about uh, 389 parts per million in the atmosphere, so we want to try and get that safe level back down. So. Okay, I don't understand what that means. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lani, can you just break that down a little bit further? Yeah. What's 350, what's 392, what well, does that mean? 350, um, the organisation we're part of, 350.org, it's a international movement based on um, getting the number back to 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, so what that means is that there are gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide being one of them. Um, 350 parts per million is the amount that's considered safe for humanity. Mm -hmm. So um, this number, we've named our organization after this number, mm -hmm. counting to bringing back uh, our level which is at 393 now, mm -hmm. back down to 350. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, yeah, so it's going up because of um, humanity's actions and mm -hmm. things like that, and then just the natural fluctuations mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the earth. It's, it's just explain it in three seconds, it's kind of difficult, but um, yeah. yeah, it's basically, <laughs> it's, it's based on the level that is considered safe for humanity, which is 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, now you are both youth activists mm -hmm. and you're part of 350. So what do you do in your group? What makes you an active, a youth activist? Oh, well, basically for the Moving Planet Day, which is uh, 24th of September, we um, are basically the facilitators for Christchurch. So we um, are organising some sort of movement around um, the climate change okay. um, movement. So we... Uh, helping to facilitate for Christchurch and um, bringing some people together mm -hmm. to organise that. So um, there's a whole group of us that are working together, you know, young, old, and mm -hmm. um, we, yeah, uh, so we're just helping it out, get it going. So the day is Moving Planet, a day without fossil fuels. So this is throughout the world, or is this a New Zealand fixture? It's, yeah. it's international. Um, it's exciting because 350.org started in 2007, um, an organisation called Step It Up, and I remember when it started, um, it was quite small, but they, the big thing was this, this day of action. Um, and it's evolved into 350.org, which is an international organization. Mm -hmm. There's like 183 countries that have, have official branches now. Um, in the past two years, um, they've had days of action. Um, last year was 10-10-10. There was a big movement in New Zealand as well as all over the world. Um, and CNN has been calling it the biggest political movement of all time. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, our day of action this year is Moving Planet, um, September 24th. So that's going to be a, another big thing too. So yeah. um, if you go online or if you watch the news, I'm from the States, so I'm, I'm also watching what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of things happening. So it's it's definitely international and it's definitely going to be big. And okay. yeah, should be and good. I think the idea is moving away from fossil fuels to renewable energies. So okay. it's um, got a goal in the end rather than just stop using this, use instead re use renewables. Why is it so important <coughs> for the peer of you to be involved with this? Well, we basically need to get the word out there and show that anyone can do it. So anyone can be involved and you just got to get out there and do it. You just want to 
we just got a passion to show, yeah. you know, we see with what we do at uni and all that what the effects are and mm. so basically that's why we just wanted to get involved and just do it and I mean once, you, once you're aware you can't just be, you know, blind to it, you've just got to do it. What's this doing to our planet, to Earth? Well, <laughs> you know, it's... What is, what, what is the... What is the lever? What's the Ooh. um three ninety three? Well, <laughs> tell us what it's doing. Stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, it's you can't really uh, pinpoint a lot of them because like there's just a cumulative effects of like a whole pile of things, things you can't see that are happening as well. So, like for example, the global warming, you know, that's occurring because of it, and um, you know, because it's causing a layer to warm up in between, and things are just going to get warmer, and then of course extreme weather events. So you're going to get um, you know, like intense snow or like, and like intense heating and all sorts of things like that. But it just affects everything in quite, um, I don't want to be negative, but in quite a negative way sometimes, you know. But, yeah, yeah, the really difficult thing is um, just the way science is formed, that it's um, things take time to come up and things take time to register as this mm. is what's really happening. And just the Earth goes through natural fluctuations in um, just atmospheric composition and um, heat and cool cycles. And because we've been adding carbon dioxide and all this to the atmosphere because of the Industrial Revolution, burning co you know, fossil fuels, things like that, um, it is accumulating. But just in our lifetimes, because we have very short lifetimes in comparison to the rest of, you know, the Earth's, mm. it's it's really difficult to see. And I think now we're starting to see, people have been saying, you know, oh, there's going to be a problem since the 1960s, 1970s, you know, just because if you look at, I mean, the atmosphere is, you know, it's it's contained, so it's going it's going to accumulate. And I think now we're starting to see like, oh, mm. yes, there are problems being called, caused. Um, you know, greenhouse 101. Long story short, the Earth is a you know is a, is a sphere. There are gases around the Earth that keep it at a constant, somewhat consistent temperature range. Mm. Um, if you add to that, it's like making another blanket. And if the heat is getting trapped, it's going to reflect and it's going to heat up like you know the greenhouse right. effect. Yeah. So right. it's it's really difficult to to say, oh look, it's happening right now because now mm. we're starting to see what's happening 30 years ago because of the way. Um, the delay works. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So to find out more, we can go to 350.org yeah. and to find more about moving planet a day without fossil fuels, September 24. How can we find out more about that? There's a website, movingplanet.org. Okay. It's yeah. really cool because it's not just 350. It's World yeah. Wildlife Fund. Um, it's okay. Sierra Club all over the place. So right. it's, it's an international website. Excellent. Yeah. September 24. Sasha Nolani, thanks for coming on the program. Sure, definitely. After the break, we find out more about the draft Central City Plan. Welcome back. In keeping with our series looking into the draft Central City Plan, here's our reporter Gracie Fee catching up with Hugh Nicholson, the principal urban designer. So what are the main aspects that the redeveloped Central City is, is going to offer? Well, one of the key themes for the, for the, um, the Central City Plan is, is, is city life. And, um, and we, we, see, we want to make the city a vibrant, um, desirable place to live. We see this happening in, in, in a number of ways, and the, the council will, um, well, three, three ways we see, we see this being promoted. One is, the, is investment in public facilities, so catalyst projects to, 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 to bring people and activity back to the central city. One is through um, the investment in, in, in infrastructure, so in, in, um, in, in a smart city, sort of in broadband, you know, as we replace and repair the infrastructure around the central city. And the, and the third area is through providing regulation and incentive, incentives you know, to encourage private development to, 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 to happen in the central city. Because in the end of the day, it's likely that the private investment will be much greater than, than, than government investment. What we'd like to see is a, is more mixed use. So we envisage that there'll be more. We hope there'll be more people living in the central city. Um, we will be be encouraging this through incentives. So providing incentives for for residents. So um, remissions on development contributions. 
um, and possibly supporting um, um, first home buyers um, to reducing the level of, of deposit required to, to, to buy a house in the central city. We'll also be um, we're looking at regulatory changes to make it um, easier to, to, to build houses in the, in the central city and to ensure that they're of a good quality so that um, they're, they're good places to live. This is obviously a broad vision. Is, is it realistic? Um, we'd like to think it is. Um, and Well, it is realistic. But look, um, as I've always said, the, um, the future of the central city is really in the hands of the people of Christchurch both the, the, the landowners, the, the business people, but also the public. People choose to come and live and enjoy the central city, we can make it a great place again. If they choose not to come back, then, they, then, then you know, it'll, it'll become a, you know, uh, um, a dead end, I guess. Um, so um, one of our first challenges is to, is to attract business and investment back to the central city. So we, the central city plan aims to give confidence, to give a clear direction as to how we see the, you know, a vision as to how we see the central city developing, and um, and to and to provide some direction as to sort of the development we'd like to see. Okay, what have the community asked for in the central city? What are the main things that they want? Um, look, they asked for, for 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 a wide range of things, and I'd really encourage people to go and look at the shareanidea.org. .nz website which, um, which summarises a lot of the public feedback. But particularly they were interested in a, in a vibrant central city, a central city which had a, a range of activities and, um, and lots of green space. It had lots of people, so it had interest, it had people living there, but it had um, you know, good retail, it had um, um, a range of offices. Um, there, was a, there, were, there was quite an opinion on, on whether or not it should be the centre for offices for the whole of Christchurch, but certainly activities and the, and, and the range of activities was a key theme. And I suppose the atmosphere is what will make or break the city. Everyone knows that central city is the heart of any city. Um, how are you hoping to capture that atmosphere and create a vibrant city for the community like they asked for? Well. Um, we, we were, we're planning to invest in a number of, of, of public facilities and in particular we're looking at a, um, investing in a, in, a, in a widened Avon River Park running through the centre of the city. So we'd like to see this as Christchurch's waterfront or riverfront um, where people can come and enjoy, um, get right down to the river's edge. So, um, so, so to build on, on an asset and that was something which struck a chord with people throughout the Share an Idea um, process. We're planning to invest in a new central city library um, as a sort of a, a centre for learning um, to bring it up. This wasn't in the, in the council's long-term um, infrastructure plan, but um, we're planning to invest in a new central city library, an extended one. We're planning to build a metropolitan sports facility, so um, a centre of sporting excellence, an aquatic centre, indoor sports courts, um, and, and, and the idea there is to attract a, a large number of people into the central city for sporting activities and to, and to develop a cluster of, of, um, of associated businesses and, and, and activities around that. Um, sport is obviously something that attracts a lot of people to a city, there's a lot of sports fans out there, so obviously that's going to be a very important thing um, to attract people, that metropolitan sports facility. Look, it's something Christchurch is pretty good at, and I don't think we celebrate it enough. You know, we all we all love the Crusaders, and they do pretty well. And um, and I think our idea here is that we start to make this a more obvious celebration. Um, look, we hope um, AMI Stadium will, will be repairable, but um, but uh, but obviously that's a little bit up in the air at the moment. Um, and we'd like to see a, a cluster of activity, you know, sporting activities in in one area. So you're hoping for the Crusaders to play in the central city one day. Well, that'd be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? <laughs> Look, I think AMI Stadium is in a good location at the moment. It actually is very close to the central city, and um, and if, if if we are able to rebuild or repair the, the stadium in that location, I think it has a good synergy with the with the with a metropolitan sports facility. And it's obviously quite diverse, having libraries and a sports facility in the central city. The other people you're hoping to attract with the library, they're just as important as, as the sports fans? Absolutely. And the other area of, of arts, of course. I mean, a sort of a key um, you know, part of the community who, who often lead the way in terms of revitalisation and regeneration of the arts community. Um, a lot of arts venues have been substantially damaged. You know, we're still waiting to hear how the town halls fared. Um, but this plan has a number of arts initiatives, both for the um, both for the performing arts, you know, the the, the and and also for the visual arts and the and, and public art as well. So really, we're hoping to, to be able to attract that those people back into the central city. We're looking at a, um, a community performance um, and rehearsal space. Um, 
looking at a, a program of public art and um, and uh, and potentially um, working with um, you know the court theatre the professional theatre groups to, to develop a new venue as well. And of course, that's a very important part of Christchurch. It's art and and theatre side of side of the city. Those people are obviously very passionate about what they want. Have they expressed very detailed? Um, plans for what they would like. We've had some great discussions with the arts community and um, I think we're still you know shaping up what that will look like but um, I think it'll be very exciting. Okay and are they the only public facilities that you're proposing for the central city or are there, are there any other significant ones? There's quite a range of, 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 of public facilities I probably won't be able to get through through all of them and some of the um, and, and some of the, the the projects are really in, uh, concerned more with incentives. So as I said, I think I mentioned the residential incentives to encourage people to live in the central city. We're also looking at um, things like playgrounds. So I think um, so prior to the earthquake, one of the um, one of the factors you know, when we surveyed the people who used the central city, it was very obvious that children and young families didn't come to the central city. So part of this, we'd like to make the central city appeal to a broader range of people. Um, and um, so we're looking at a range of playgrounds and when I talk, talk about playgrounds I think I'm meaning less about conventional playgrounds but at play environments and inspiring spaces where children can actually you know, play safely and in an in in interesting and stimulating and, and hopefully educational environment. And of, of course the adults would probably enjoy that too, secretly down under. Well I hope so, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and along the river will be a key theme for that, um, uh, for, those, for those playgrounds, so we'll look at um, finding sites there, um, but yeah, no, very positive. Maybe a lot of red zone residential areas will be turned into play areas, do you think? Look, um, a bit early to say at the stage, and I think that's and it is um, the the Sarah's, you know, the, the the government, central government's responsibility. So I don't think we can make any draw any conclusions at this stage as to what will happen there. Perhaps another really exciting area is, um, you know, we're we're looking to work with Naitahu to um, to perhaps better express um, their cultural relationship with the with the city. Obviously, you know, they are the Tangata Whenua and, um, and we think they've got a lot to offer to the city and i um, really very excited by the possibility of interpreting some um, historical sites along the Avon River and celebrating their, the you know, Naitahu culture and heritage um, within the city. Have they come forward with any ideas yet or are you still in discussions with them? We've been having a, a lot of discussions with them and they're very positive. Um, um, look, there, there aren't specific um, suggestions at this stage, but, um, but look, I'm very excited about it and looking forward to seeing what happens. Is there going to be a new kind of urban living in Christchurch? How's that, how's that going to be created? Look, I think if you look internationally, it's very um, obvious around the world that, that, um, that some people like to live in, in, in urban and central city environments. And um, certainly we can, if you look at Wellington, Christchurch, and internationally, very clear, there's a very clear trend that, that, to, for an increase in inner city residential populations. We haven't seen that to a significant degree in Christchurch at this stage. Um, and, and, and look, it won't appeal to everybody. It probably is a, you know, a small percentage of people who want to live in, a, in an urban environment. They want to live in, with lots of activities, close to culture, um, cultural events and cultural facilities. So look, I think we, we're, we're likely to see that as a result of this, um, this earthquake. Um, it's not for everybody, and, um, but you know, we think it'll, it'll add an extra dimension to the, to the inner city. Inner city. And of course that will draw people in and especially with transport uh, worries for the future and oil prices, people are wanting to live in uh, clusters among where everything's happening. That's obviously going to be an important part of planning the urban design of the city. That's, that's, that's right. One of the, although we, we, a, lot of, um, a lot of what I've talked about has been within the kind of the, 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 the central city, the CBD, the central business district if you like, we also recognise there are a series of, of, um, of inner city residential neighbourhoods around the CBD um, um, and, and those are essential you know, parts of the central city and um, so we're looking to support those through, through developing um, additional neighbourhood green space, additional neighbourhood facilities and, and we, we see them as a key um, um, supporting um, role in the, in the redevelopment of the central city. A great city is obviously one that makes people want to stay and they feel stimulated by it. What ideas have you got in mind for helping that happen? Oh look, um, a key part of the, of, the, of the plans is to create a, a high quality um, public spaces. So um, 
I think it's it's very clear that um, that where people uh, have spaces that are enjoyable and pleasant to visit, um, that they that they'll stay longer, um, they'll spend more money, they'll go into into shops more, and they'll, it'll make a, a place that people want to come back to. Um, so we have a, a program of, of, of street enhancements, particularly for the for the um, for the core of the city, the, the CBD, um, and and we hope that will complement the private investment and um, and provide a yeah, an attraction, a reason for people to come to the central city and to come back again. And you're also planning on removing zoning for residents in the central city uh, so they have more choice of schools. Is that, is that going to help with that? One of the ideas, we'd like to make this a, you know, it's a city for learning and, and a part of that is, is, is obviously a new central city library with enhanced digital facilities and, and, and possibly co-located with, with the National Archives. And, and, um, but another part of that is looking at schooling, and particularly if we want to attract families. To, and, and we felt that one very simple and relatively low cost way of attracting people into the central city was to remove the school zoning in the central city. So to give people a choice, if they came and lived here, they could send their children to school you know, where they wanted to within Christchurch. Obviously schools are a big thing for Christchurch people. We think it's uh, um, a very positive idea, but um, you know, and we're in discussions with the Ministry of Education about it. So, um, it does have um, repercussions in terms of sizes of schools, so, so they'll, 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 there's a bit more talking to, to happen yet. Okay, and you're also wanting to link the central city with tertiary education, uh, maybe a light rail system going out to the uni. What's that hope to do for the central city in terms of vibrancy and attracting people? Oh, look, um, Christchurch is tremendously fortunate. We've got three very strong tertiary institutions with um, the University of Canterbury, Lincoln University and the, and the CPIT. And um, CPIT is a, is, a, is a key stakeholder in the, in the central city. They, they have a central city campus and, um, and we look forward to working with them really closely. Very um, exciting. Um, we felt um, the University of Canterbury is in a suburban location and look for the university, it's a great site. But you know, we'd love to draw some of that energy and um, the vitality that students, student life gives back into the central city. So um, we thought one of the ways we could do that is potentially making a very strong um, public transport corridor between the university and the central city and a light rail corridor as the first stage of a more strategic network. Back after this break with Dr Warren Feeney. Finally on the program, our usual art segment with Dr. Warren Feeney. But Warren, you brought a friend Hi. with you today. <laughs> yes, um, I have. It's uh, Martin Trustrom, who's the um, stakehold uh, manager at CPIT Faculty of Creative Industries. Hmm. And we're going to talk about Art Box. Yeah. Tell me about it, because I've actually heard quite a bit of, about it already, and it's only been up yeah. and running for a couple of days, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, so no, where's the idea come from? Well, it's really Martin and the CPIT that have developed the project. Yeah, we... we um uh, over the process of the sort of gathering our forces after February, we um, realised that a lot of our, you know, as everyone did, of course, but the, all the facilities and so forth for the artists and and the communities communities that we feed into and lead and, and teach into um, had all gone, mm. and it was a real problem for us. So we decided that you know, we should do something about it, and this kind of grew out of that process. We tried several options actually, but this is the one that kind of has taken taken root. So you hope that this is going to be something that's going to encourage the arts in Christchurch. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the idea behind them is that they're mobile, flexible, cheap, um, so that the artists can basically get it back up on their feet. Gives them a reason to stay here, gives mm -hmm. them places to show, gives the, um, spaces for people to re-engage with that community, because you know, it's one of those things, arts at the end of the, of the day, is kind of probably not given the recognition it needs in the sense of how much it contributes to the life. Mm. Of, of, of a place mm -hmm. and um, in the broader sense too, I don't just mean visual arts, I mean the whole from performing through to visual and so forth, but supporting that helps people kind of live their lives and enjoy mm. their lives yeah. I think. Mm. It's, it's actually, I mean I, I always think of the whole, the project, this project and other projects involved the arts at the moment, there's so much about space, it's, it's that simple, mm. you know, mm. in terms of recovery, it's actually buildings and space to put artist studios into and exhibition space to make them visible and of course you know like everything else the infrastructure is completely gone and mm. this is um, I get I mean I like the idea of this being sort of a little bit like recreating a part of High Street it does have that yeah, aspect to, to it yeah, yeah. you know so, and, and it'll be there some of it will be on site mm -hmm. and the other thing that's really exciting about it is um, it's a very early stage of the rebuild of the city but mm. it's just got such strong protect 
potential because mm. the number of the, the modules can also be moved into other parts of the city. Mm. It's actually a really a, a, a new way in which artists will be able to engage with mm. communities okay. and with the arts and I guess also take more control over what they're doing. They mm. can do it without a dealer gallery or a gallery um, kind of representing them if mm. they wish to. Absolutely. Well let's have a look at the, the pictures that we're talking about because mm -hmm. I know that we do have some so we'll take a look at them. Mm -hmm. So can you explain what this is? Is this an actual gallery? This is an actual gallery. Um, the, the whole design originally grew up around the use of containers. Mm. Um, F3, the company that um, we're working with to, to develop these, um, came back with an idea. We were doing so much work to try to make them look less like containers. Let's start from scratch. So there's a steel frame modules. Each of them is two bays. So the light weather based on containers, they're actually cubic, so they can join together at right angles and then um, so that's vertically and laterally, so they okay. can stand up. Um, we can stack them on top of each other so we can take, um, you know, have floors and staircases oh, wow. from level to level. Yeah. But in this case here we've got six modules or six two bay modules joined together in this combination here to provide um, an interesting exhibition space. Okay. Still framed, we have um, most likely um, all the interior floors and wall spaces that, um, for showing work will be plywood mm -hmm. um, basically and then we'll have the windows will be uh, full panels polycarbonate um, cellular um, either translucent or transparent to allow you know the, obviously the light through and then on the outside of them will be three form 3d formed steel um, components which will be painted in bright colors okay so it's um, so this is a different view of it yeah so these are basically each of those boxes or the square that that person standing in now is yeah. round just under three meters square right. um, and so while we it's not clear space it's basically um, you know it's you know it's uh, open space anyway right. and you can move around it and reorganize the walls pretty much in any combination. Okay so where's that? Well this is this was, one, this was an initial concept um, of a little uh, art box city if you like. Mm -hmm. It's much grander than what we'll have at this stage unless we get a extremely good funding. Um, but the idea here is that just to sort of show how they can be stacked you can see some of them in the middle that are standing up on end which yeah. could be light wells for example. Mm -hmm. um, there's two and three stories all together in that. They can be grouped together in large combinations to form a building effectively mm -hmm. um, or can be separated and run independently say by a design retail store for example okay. or an artist who wants just a couple of bays on their own. Yep. Um, and they're quite sculptural. They, they, are, quite sculptural. they, are, they are actually kind of a work of art all of their own. The mm -hmm. way okay. they can be reconfigured and changed. Pippin Wright Stowe who runs the, um, the F3 company is actually designing his house using these. He oh went, really? Because he, he and uh, Andrew just started to work on these and then he said I want to do my house. He's building his house. I want to do my house in this. So oh it's, um, my gosh. He's designed some extra modules apart from um, what we've got included here to make that work. But so the idea is already taking on. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And yeah. it's, we've had approaches from um, some commercial interests around the city as, as a kind of a quick, cheap, um, uh, or cost effective. It's not exactly cheap, but yeah. it's certainly, but compared to the other options, quite cost effective mm. way of setting up some retail components too. Okay. So that could be another use for them going down the track. Now, and Warren, you were um, starting a f your fundraising for yeah, this. Yeah. So tell yeah. me about this. Well, I talked with Webb's uh, Auctions in, Auc in Auckland about this, and it actually followed on from opening Chambers 241 in the gallery, our space. We'd had some works offered to us by artists to auction, and we thought about taking them up to Auckland. When I spoke to Webb's, they said, why don't you look at doing a bigger fundraiser? than just you know half a dozen works. So I talked to Martin about this. Um, I was aware of the, the module project and it seemed an ideal notion. I mean, you know, do a fundraiser but do it once and do it uh, on, on a bigger scale. So mm. I've been contacting, well we actually only started last week but the interest and the feedback's been great. We've, I mean, I, obviously I'm seeking artists, I want to support it but also we're getting offers from other artists coming in. and. Certainly the feedback has just been consistently very, very strong. Mm. I think people just really pleased. The arts community and the artists I've talked to just seem so pleased that there is something mm. that's affirmative, something that's very tangible because mm. these, mm. you know, they cost $12,500 each to to, um, to make and with 18 of them you've got a very uh, kind of tangible and very solid way in which the arts can actually partly be put back on their feet very quickly and, mm. and they look great too, mm. so mm -hmm. yeah. So can artists still get some space in there or is it all Absolutely. taken up? No, not yet. <laughs> yeah. no, we, at the moment we're just starting to, well, we're very shortly we'll be going out and saying if you want a book space now, mm. you know, drop us a line. Mm. 
um, and uh, people can book them for sort of three weeks if they want to have a show. Great. Um, they can use them as sort of like an artist in residence space where they might take them up for an entire year, mm -hmm. um, which is also fine. Yep. Um, so really it's just a matter of people kind of submitting the applications to us once we get on. All right. So it should be very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can they, do they get in touch with you, Martin? Well, they can get in touch. We're basically building a website at the moment okay. which will have a submission form as part of that. And so um, essentially it'll be through that medium. But I mean, if they get in touch with Warren or yep. myself I, as well, yeah. I mean, both in any way is fine. Yeah, great. But we just want to make it easy, really, as easy as possible so that um, when's this fundraiser happening it's the 20 um, th th 27th sorry I was yeah, yeah 27th, <laughs> it's the 27th of October yeah. at Webb so and um, yeah at the moment we've got confirmation Julia Morrison Dick Frizzell uh, Peter Larkin some really really strong names and uh, good interest too from I mean you know the Elam School of Fine Art have indicated they are very positive about the project as well. Mm. So, right. yeah. It's very exciting. When do you hope to get yeah. up and running by? Well, all going well by, we'll have the first ones out in the beginning of November. Great. So, we're just going through the process of about to um, start a prototype, mm -hmm. have a little launch party when that's open. Yep. Um, going through the council process, which is a sort of a, you know, a consents sort of thing, which is underway. Um, so, it's yeah, all going well. It'll be around then. All right. Well, Martin, thanks for coming on the program. Warren, really good to see you thanks. as per usual. So people can get in touch with you, warrenfeniaextra.co.nz. Yeah, that'll be fine. Great. Okay. Now, that is City Life for today. You can get in touch with us. You can email me, kineta, at ctv.co.nz. You can call us, 3777-033, or you can write to us, PO Box 1100 Christchurch. Now, you can watch episodes of City Life on demand. Just go to ctv.co.nz, find the big YouTube logo, click on that, and then you'll go to City Life. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.